Welcome into this Five Clubs conversation. I'm Gary Williams. This has been probably the most turbulent period that we've seen in men's professional golf in our lifetimes. And what's going to happen with suspensions to players who were formerly on the PGA Tour? Some resign their membership. Are they going to avoid those penalties? And what does happen with potential antitrust violations or tax-exempt status that the PGA Tour currently holds? Because it appears that all of this stuff that's going on with the PGA Tour and Live Golf is headed to court. Well, I'm going to talk to somebody who is an expert on sports law. That is Michael McCann. He's a professor, and as I said, he knows the language of the law of sports as contracts are written and as it pertains to antitrust and antitrust exemptions that are currently afforded to sports businesses like the PGA Tour. That conversation is coming up now. that we welcome in michael mccann michael how are you sir i'm doing well gary thanks for having me on today well i I know that there are a lot of people who are trying to pick your brain because you know this is an area that that golf specifically has found itself a little bit over the last several years but it's been such a lower profile type of situation as it pertains to you know whether it's antitrust issues or tax exempt status now we've got this this very turbulent time when it comes to the PGA Tour and the Live Golf Series. And with Jay Monahan putting the suspensions down that, that he made public, which was new ground for them, let me start with this. What do you think the biggest issue the PGA Tour is going to have trying to enforce those suspensions? Well, I think one is going to be if any of the players challenge them in court. So that's going to be an interesting pivot point if, in fact, a player goes to court and seeks an injunction that that requests that a court say, look, Tor, you can't enforce this penalty. It's illegal or could be illegal under antitrust law. We need more time to review this. In the meantime, you have to allow these golfers to be able to play as they normally would. So that that is going to be a crucial point in the timeline if that happens. We don't know if that's going to happen. Right? It remains to be seen whether or not players are going to go that route and also how many players are, are going to be suspended. I think that that's really an important question because the more players that are suspended, particularly of the higher caliber, the more the tour has to think about whether that's the best path because they don't want to start excluding some of their best players that would make, that would be damaging to the brand. It would be damaging to competition if they're losing some of their best players, you know, the, the, NBA wouldn't wouldn't suspend four of the best 10 players in the league, right? It would probably be bad for for the product. So those are some things that have to be considered. And also, Gary, what what Live Golf will do? Will they be proactive here? They clearly have tremendous financial resources to retain lawyer. I mean, so does the tour. I mean, these are sort of two titans in terms of uh, access to resources to pay for lawyers. But they, they could, both sides could be creative here, uh, which could mean quite a bit of litigation. We'll have to see. Michael, the, the players who resigned their memberships before they, they played in the first Live Series event, did that surprise you? A little bit because by resigning, they might forfeit a potential claim that they have against the tour. They're basically saying we quit and an argument could be had that gets suspended first because then you've been then you've suffered a harm from the tour that you could use in a court filing to say look if they suspended me this is illegal by quitting it it does disadvantage their position somewhat they could still bring a case but yeah i was surprised i guess i would have advised to say let the tour suspend you first now maybe they just don't maybe they don't care maybe they're just like well you know we're going to live golf and life is good and we don't want to deal with uh, you and other lawyers, right? So uh, sometimes people have that reaction understandably, but I was a little bit surprised. The, um, 
the, the idea that, that there would be an injunction potentially, and let's say there is one, and, and, and players then during the, this particular period would be permitted, I assume, to go back, play on the PGA Tour. And my question would be, realistically, how long would it be before that injunction would be resolved? And, and I ask that question because I, I would think that it'd be, it would be a little bit of time and that would probably carry through the, to the end of what would be the Live Golf Series' fall events, which is the end of October. Is that reasonable? Yeah, no, that's right. So an injunction could be appealed to a federal court of appeals, but normally that process isn't swift. Normally it's not you know, days. We're talking weeks or months, sometimes even longer, depending upon the circumstances. So I think it's reasonable to think that if there is an injunction, it would remain in place for a while. Uh, granted, sometimes that's not always true. Sometimes we've seen courts, even in sports, back in the lockout in 2010 in the NFL, courts were uh, pretty active in responding quickly. Uh, and I know from being part of a case involving a would-be NFL player, Maurice Claret, who challenged the NFL's age restriction, uh, I got to be part of that case as a young lawyer. And the the courts were were responsive there. So sometimes with sports, courts seem to move things quickly, I guess. But but yeah, I agree with the, the sort of takeaway you have, Gary, that uh, we, we'd be looking at some time before the injunction, if it's appealed, would be resolved. The, um, the language in the bylaws of the PGA Tour as far as what would put a player in breach of conduct unbecoming or, 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 or grounds for suspension this particular language, based on the way you read it, uh, would, would doing the things that they're doing, which is going to play for a league um, that, again, they're, they're in a position to ask for waivers to play in other events uh, outside of North America. Does the language support the PJ's Tours position that they would be in breach of the contract they sign on an annual basis? I think the tour has a good argument, honestly. That language is very ambiguous and it gives discretion to the tour to treat questions for waivers as, as those that the, the tour has wide latitude in deciding what's appropriate. The, the argument that, well, you know, they've, when I've heard this, that, well, they've given waivers to other things, but that doesn't mean they have to give a waiver to this thing, right? Just because they've given a waiver in the past doesn't obligate them to do it here. And, and I would, if I were the tour, I would say this language is very permissive. It accords us tremendous discretion. We have an understandable interest in not helping out a would-be rival take our players, our members, to, put, to be more specific. So I think the tour has a, has a decent argument there, to be honest with you, Gary. Now, there, there's an antitrust counter argument, which is, well, this is very anti-competitive and the tour has too much control. So there's that line of thinking, but it, it's very hard to show in law that a membership organization is acting unlawfully when it's applying its own rules. The typical standards is what's called arbitrary and capricious, which is basically that this is so arbitrary what they're doing that it's illegal. Very tough to show. That's a very deferential standard. And I, I, I mean, look, we'll, we'll, we'll see if there is a lawsuit, what's argued, but I think the tour has a pretty good argument there. The, the distinction between being an employee and being an independent contractor in, in a case such as this, does an employee potentially have more latitude when it comes to this or is it the other way around? It, it, it sort of cuts both ways. So an employee, if, it, if this was another league, the employee would be part of a union and the union would have a collective bargaining agreement and the significance of that is that the CBA would take antitrust law off the board. So that would be good for the league, right? So that there can't be an antitrust lawsuit if there's a CBA. So in that regard, it helps the golfers that they're not in a union in this particular frame. Now, it doesn't necessarily mean it's a good thing in other ways, but in, in regard to the capacity to bring an antitrust case, it's helpful to the golfers that there's no that they're not employees and not, more importantly, not unionized. The employee aspect is also significant because we know they don't have employment contracts, but they have agreed to membership terms in writing. So they still are bound contractually to the tour. We also know that the Justice Department has been aggressive with 
uh, under, under the current administration, helping out or enforcing employee rights and the rights of independent contractors. And there's this whole sort of re uh, ongoing debate about who's an independent contractor. Should we even have that, that our employers misusing it? The counter argument is that independent contracting has benefits to those that are doing it. Some don't want to be an employee. They want to be able to go to different, have different people paying them. So there's all sorts of di uh, different aspects to this. But I would say, Gary, in this context, the advantage to the golfers is that they can argue that they're being sort of mistreated, that they're not bound to the same extent to the tour. They should have more flexibility in dropping the tour. The, again, the counter argument there is, yeah, but you agreed to these membership rules. You're, you're still a member. And also you can't bring it in yeah, be, because uh, because they're not in a, a union, they can't they can bring an antitrust case. So that helps them in that regard. So it sort of cuts both ways. You know, Michael, as you know, by announcing the suspensions just publicly, that was unprecedented. They don't do that. They, they don't share disciplinary action uh, of their members. So so that was new ground for them um, as far as the, the idea of of not specifically saying for how long was that the right decision that the, the tour made even though internally they may they, they may know how long they would like to enforce these suspensions that it was probably the proper thing to be kind of ambiguous about the, the length of time that they are being suspended for yeah i think as an initial step it makes sense because they really they may not know yet they want to see who's how many how many golfers are doing this right they want to they want to figure out what the marketplace is with live golf and by coming up with with an indefinite period of time they're not worried about one of the golfers going to court to say well it's unreasonable to suspend me for x months or x years or x weeks whatever it may be so they're trying to keep it open and maybe also gives them ground to backtrack if it turns out that too many golfers are doing this and that suspensions would end up hurting the tour so i think it makes sense that the one potential drawback to that strategy, at least if there's litigation, is that a golfer could say an indefinite suspension is really unfair because you're not you're hurting my career by not informing me what harm I'm actually suffering from this consequence. And you're making it difficult for me to consider other career opportunities. So it may or may not be good for them in court, but as an initial move, I understand why they did it. The, the Sherman Act, if people haven't heard it much now, they may hear it a lot more going forward. Uh, the Sherman Act, which is an act to protect trade and commerce, um, it, as, as you look at it now, is, is, is the PGA Tour in violation of the Sherman Act in any way? I'm not sure. So the Sherman, it's interesting, the Sherman Act is, was originally intended for nothing to do with sports. It was intended for oil and, <laughs> right. Right, and all these other industries where there, there wasn't enough competition. Too many families had too much control. Right. Now it's in sports, right? It's, <laughs> it's funny how things turn out. But uh, well, look, look, I think the argument that the tour is in violation of antitrust law would be that uh, it is what's, what would be termed a monopsony, that it, it, it is the exclusive buyer of elite golfer services. Uh, this is an argument that's been used against the UFC, not successfully to date, but that they have too much control over the purchasing of elite MMA fighter skills. The analogy here would be that the best golfers go to the tour. Now, the counter argument, I think the tour would say, is that live golf is structured differently, that uh, it's not, uh, a, a, we're not trying to, to prevent a rival, that it's a, it's a different kind of league than what the tour does. Uh, and, and as a result, a golfer that uh, chooses can, can can choose to join Live Golf, and and obviously there are consequences by facing a suspension. But I think they would argue that they're not a monopoly; that it's le that there's more disaggregation. That Live Golf is offering a different type of service. There are other leagues, maybe I think in Asia, that offer other opportunities. That yeah, the PGA Tour ha is structured in a certain way that is unique but that doesn't mean it, it has monopsony power and thus isn't violating antitrust law. The other argument that I think the tour would argue is to say, our system is good for the consumer. Because with, with antitrust law, the key thing is how is the consumer hurt? Here in this context, the golf fan. The tour is gonna say, look at the product we deliver to fans. It has historically been excellent. Golf is super popular. TV ratings are great. People go to, to watch golf. 
if you prevent us from operating this way, if it's an antitrust violation to operate this way, the golf fan is the one that's going to be hurt, that there will be chaos, that, that there won't be certainty as to how it's structured. So the, the tour will also argue not only is it not operating uh, as a monopsony, but it's also operating in a way that benefits the fans. Now, the counter argument, Gary, is going to be, well, uh, you, you control, you, the tour, control too much power. And uh, as a result, golfers' opportunities are being excluded. Uh, so it's an interesting sort of set of dual arguments, but I think the tour has some decent arguments there. The, um, you know, the status that the PGA Tour has, they, they have tax exempt status, they have antitrust exemptions. Um, when you go into a courtroom, what, what, what fear of exposure should the PGA Tour be worrying about here? I think any kind of litigation runs the risk of pretrial discovery where confidential or documents that an organization or league thinks are confidential become public. And the, the tour, as you mentioned earlier, doesn't announce suspensions. Uh, I mean, they, they sort of, they're kind of closed door, right? They, they kind of do things uh, with, without transparency, you might say, that, that say another league would be more transparent about. And that, if that's the culture of the, of the tour, that runs the risk of going up against how courts view litigation where books are open, emails are shared, texts are disclosed. And if it's litigation, it's public generally, uh, where media journalists will get to go on, uh, Pacer is the, is the website for, for federal litigation. They can go on and download all this stuff and it could run the risk of hurting not only the tour, but those who run it, uh, potentially exposing things that they don't want exposed. So, that, that to me is the real risk with litigation. Even, even if the tour wins, the, the battle to get there could be damaging. The, um, looking back, 2015, there was a class action lawsuit brought by caddies against the tour using antitrust and intellectual property claims uh, that, that as far as that being resolved, it, it went in the favor of, of the PGA Tour. Do things like that um, and there was another, there was another case uh, as it pertained to a specific player and an individual that, that the ruling went in favor uh, of the PGA Tour. Are those things that they can lean on uh, when, when you go into a situation where you're then put into a courtroom? Yeah, they, they can. Now, now, the counter argument is they're not specific or, or not, they're not parallel sets of facts to what we have here. Right. Right. Caddies are obviously... Uh, operating in a different space. But, but Gary, you're right. They will say we've been subject to review, including antitrust review, and our organization has passed that review, that we're structured in a way that courts have found lawful. And uh, even if we have substantial control, we operate in a, in a unique way that other leagues operate in their own unique way. They could say live golf, their system is similar to, uh, has too much control over the way in which they're structured. Right? So there are counter arguments that can be that we use. But yeah, the short answer to your question is they can and will no doubt rely on any kind of favorable precedent, even if the situation in those cases is different. The, the tour is a 501c6. Um, and for people who are going, well, I've heard 501c3. Can you explain the distinction uh, between those two? And, and what, if any, relevancy does that have uh, for the tour in this situation? Sure. So it's operating. It's not operating as a charity, per se. It's operating uh, as a nonprofit entity. And it's, it's not the NFL was structured like that for many years. Uh, and so I think maybe five years ago. And the. the and I remember doing a, a, an article on the NFL in their structure. And a lot of people say, well, how are they nonprofit? They make billions and billions of dollars. Well, it's the teams that make the billions. The league itself doesn't. And the league decided to drop that uh, in part because of the disclosure requirements of these types of entities that they have to share public filings. They have to reveal how much executives make. We no longer hear what Roger Goodell makes. We only hear about it through word of mouth. Previously, it was filed. And so I think sometimes you see these, these terminologies and people are like, well, they're not charities, but that, that, that's not the test. It's not, a, it's not whether they're a charity. It's whether they're operating a way in which 
their profits are not being used to, uh, they're not a profit maximizing entity. They're really operated in a way that's trying to function uh, as an association. And in this context, it is, it is an association of golf in the NFL, it's an association of NFL teams. But the, the, the big thing with, with these classifications is that there's disclosure requirements. And I think that sometimes leads organizations to not go that route. Yeah, I, it, it's interesting. You look back, Tim Fincham, who actually spent some time in Jimmy Carter's administration uh, in the early 90s, the, the, the tour, I think, had a run in with the Federal Trade Commission on antitrust claims and, and no action was taken then. And then you also more recently had the Tax Reform Act that, that, that it appeared there might be provisions that could have compromised the, the status of the PGA Tour as it currently is constructed. But then the language in that was removed from the bill. My point is they've had some nervy times as it relates to their, their tax exempt status, their, their antitrust exemptions. Um, and I got to believe that that has to be front and center on their minds as they go down this road. Is it not, Michael? Yeah, it's a good point because this is the tour is now getting a lot of media attention in ways it doesn't want and lawmakers could easily politicians could could clearly use this as an opportunity to say let's have hearings let's talk about this business model let's let's revisit some of these legal protections that they have and the appropriateness of them so that has to be a worry to the tour that this they're getting a lot of attention in a way it doesn't advance their financial interests because we're starting to think, are, are they, do they have too much control over golf? And is, is the law structured in a way that gives them too much discretion? Uh, I'm not saying that's the case, but I'm saying that those ideas, like you just said, uh, if we're thinking about them, then I'm sure politicians are thinking about them. And, uh, you know, there's nothing like a hearing that the media will cover. And we've seen that vehicle used in sports. Michael, a lot of people thought that, that maybe the PGA Tour would get cover uh, with the four major championships, uh, that if the, if the majors put themselves in a position where they, the suggestion was made or even the decision was made that they would prevent players who are currently in the Live Series from playing in their championships, that that would be a hell of a roadblock for a lot of these players as far as knowing how important they are but the USGA, clearly, with players playing in the U.S. Open, the RNA, I expect to follow suit. These are governing bodies. The PGA of America is one of the largest sports organizations in the world. Uh, and even though they were not in the position to have to make a decision on this, my understanding is they were going to let players play. Then the last one's Augusta National. And they're a private club, and it's an invitational. What, what if any expectation do you have on, on any of them, and specifically Augusta National, on where they might decide on this? Well, here's the risk if they, if they decide to just sort of endorse what the tour does. The risk is that they get labeled a co-conspirator in an antitrust case. That's the real risk. I mean, there are other risks, because that's one risk, is that if a player is excluded because one of the entities you just mentioned, including Augusta, decides to essentially adopt what the tour is doing with respect to live golf, a player could argue that they are part of a conspiracy under federal antitrust law to harm golfers. So I, my guess, if I'm their counsel, I wouldn't want to be brought into any kind of litigation. It doesn't really benefit them. So that's one consideration that I would think is going through their minds. And the other is maybe autonomy. Why, why are they, they, they want to, they've traditionally said we're not the tour, right? If they're just, parroting whatever the tour does, it runs the risk of looking like they're not really calling their own shots. So that could have some uh, pushback as well. The, um, the, the, the idea of the players who go to live and if they, if it, let, let, whether they resign their membership or not, let, let's say some of them find themselves in a position to, to, be, to be named in a case, would it be your belief anyway that they would appeal to live and say, look, I'm going to do this. I'm going to come play for you. But in the event that we get hauled into a courtroom, you're going to handle all my, I mean, I'm not paying for this. Would you expect that the, the, the live golf organization, which is funded by the Saudi government is going to, ha going to handle all this from a legal standpoint? Well, it'd be interesting to know what, whatever their 
contractual agreement is whether there's any kind of indemnity clause. And I don't know, I haven't seen it, but if there's an indemnity clause that would address that. If there's no indemnity clause, then it's really up to Live Golf and I guess by extension, the Saudi government to, to decide to support that, to, to pay for legal fees. Now, I think the sense we get is that there's a lot of money there. And uh, if they're willing to pay golfers all this money, then they may be willing to pay the lawyers. And Live Golf has a pretty vested stake in seeing any kind of litigation favor the golfers that join Live Golf. So my, my hunch is that they would be receptive, but I haven't seen a contract, nor do I know if there's any kind of indemnity clause in it. A couple more things, Michael. You mentioned your hunch, um, and, and you, you spoke favorably on a few things language-wise as it pertains to the PGA Tour. My hunch is that this is going to court. I assume you feel the same way? Yeah, I, I just hard to imagine the number of entities involved, the number of players involved, and most importantly, the amount of money involved. That it doesn't go. It doesn't mean it's going to be. There's going to be a trial, but the filing of a lawsuit. I think the odds of that are pretty good. What do you think the tour's greatest fear is? Yeah, well, I I think too many golfers dropping them and going to live golf. That has to be the center fear for them that. They get eclipsed by live golf. I don't think that's going to happen to be clear, but if I were the tour, I would be worried about how the market beyond the law, I would just be worried about the marketplace that if they start suspending golfers, will the golfers say, okay, bye. And does that hurt the tour? The, the, the tour has traditionally had such dominance that they don't want to lose that. That to me would be mission number one to ensure that they don't lose that kind of stature in the industry. And then secondly, I would worry about, even if their legal arguments are good, I would worry about the risk of free trial discovery, like we talked about, that the tour has traditionally been a, a, not the most transparent organization. And I don't mean that necessarily in a super critical way, sure, I'm just saying it's just the truth. how they operate, right? It's, yeah. it's the truth, right? So if, if that's sort of their MO, uh, judges don't care. Right? Judges will say, you turn over those documents and litigation involves public filing. So I would worry about what, what again, I'm not part of the tour, but I would worry what, what gets revealed. The, um, the greatest thing that they would have to lose beyond the idea that these players would temporarily get an injunction which would allow them to play however many events they would choose to play, um, do you, does your hunch tell you that, that their tax-exempt status or their antitrust exemptions are in peril in any way right now? You know, I, I, we haven't seen Congress really do much with any sort of sports. I mean, there, there are always hearings. I mean, look at name, image, and likeness in college sports. Yeah. There were 10 bills, numerous hearings. I got to testify in one. Uh, nothing, nothing, not only was nothing passed, but nothing was voted on. So I, I, I always have a hunch, or, or baseball's antitrust exemption. I mean, there's all, there are always hearings, and I don't think the tour wants to be dragged before Congress, but whether it actually leads to a, a vote on a bill, let alone passage, that I'm more skeptical of. Michael, I really appreciate you taking the time. This is, this is useful information for people who are in a place as golf fans that, that a lot of us, uh, including me who covers the game, have not been before. I mentioned those other situations. They were, they were modest in attention uh, and they did not carry the kind of gravity that this current situation uh, certainly does. May appeal to you soon enough again, but really appreciate you taking the time. Anytime. Thanks, Gary, for having me on. Thank you, Michael. Really appreciate Michael McCann uh, taking the time as somebody who is an expert on sports law. And usually I leave the tedious legalese uh, to Jay Billis, but we figured we would dip our toes in the water because it's important and it's real and it's happening uh, with respect to the PGA Tour and Live Golf. So thank you to Michael. Most importantly, thank you to all of you for watching and listening to this Five Clubs conversation. We'll see you next time. <laughs>